nice guitars. Is that a Gibson? We can start rolling. Kate, you didn't hear my question. Is that a Gibson behind you? Uh, I don't know. Oh. I think there's there's a whole collection of guitars on the wall and none of them are mine. So <laughs> I'm I'm not an expert. Okay, I think we'll start rolling uh, with uh, questions about anything. About last lecture, about the course in general. Um, you should have received a notice uh, about uh, course evaluation. I'd be very grateful if everybody would fill that out. Um, I'm uh, very open to suggestions on what to improve. Um, and uh, so it helps me and other students in future years, if you can do that. Everybody sees the screen, everybody signed in. And I'll give the last stragglers 30 more seconds. So today we're going to shift gears. Uh, this is a long module. It's almost certainly going to take two sessions. Uh, so far, we talked about the hippocampus and uh, the way in which uh, space, space. I've just been to the dentist, and if I talk funny, you'll know why. Um, so uh, we were talking about the hippocampus and space, and now we're going to shift uh, and talk about the hippocampus and its role in memory and memory consolidation. I think what you'll see, uh, and maybe a take home message is uh, that the two are quite strongly related. And my view is that the hippocampus evolved uh, largely to help uh, lower vertebrates uh, represent space. They didn't have much cortex, but as the cortex got bigger and bigger, uh, the connections between the hippocampus and the cortex uh, took on kind of a new role. Uh, and I'm going to unpack that for you. Um, the hippocampal um, anatomy is largely conserved, uh, certainly in mammals it's highly conserved, but you can find traces of hippocampus in turtles and lizards. Uh, it's hard, it doesn't have quite the same structure, but uh, people have kind of identified a lot of the same components. Um, all right, so, and we talked about HM and the results of the hippocampal lesion last time. And uh, we talked about the standard model for memory consolidation, which we're going to update as we go today. Uh, this is sort of uh, a, a uh, illustration of some of the data uh, that gave rise to the standard model. Uh, where um, the, these are from different studies showing that uh, in normal subjects, uh, these are humans here and here, and these are uh, rodents here. 
uh, in nor normal animals show a certain amount of forgetting of the whatever it was they were learning over time. Notice the different time scales here. A oh, Winokur, I think, is actually uh, rodents. Uh, so this is uh, human stuff down here, a very long time, a much shorter time uh, for the rodent studies. But in any case, uh, what it shows is basically what is illustrated here, that uh, for memories that were acquired just before the damage to the hippocampus, recall uh, much later is very, very poor. Uh, and as time goes by uh, into the distant past, the memory for uh, events that were learned becomes not significantly different from controls. Um, and that's what gave rise to the standard model of retrograde amnesia and memory consolidation. Um, and so we're gonna sort of address the reasons that we think uh, the brain uh, has this, uh, shows the, this, this dynamics. Uh, and we're gonna approach it from two points of view. One is kind of uh, related to uh, the um, issue that I just mentioned that in the mammals, the cerebral cortex has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and in some sense, uh, as a consequence of that, it's uh, developed an increasing dependence on the hippocampus uh, for uh, acquiring new memories. And then we're gonna also talk about a computational reason having to do with what memory consolidation really means. Uh, and to give you the take home message up front, uh, memory consolidation is the conversion uh, or the amalgamation of a lot of uh, different experiences into uh, a kind of generalized knowledge, which is often called semantic memory in humans. It's knowledge about you know, how the world operates, the properties of objects and uh, the, uh, what you would expect to happen in certain scenarios and schemas and so forth. Uh, th that are largely de detached from distinct memories that occurred and are localized in time and space. Okay, so um, that's kind of the take home message that we're gonna be working towards. Uh, and so to start in the first uh, domain about why we have a uh, hippocampus, you all remember uh, this basic model and uh, you all, may remember that I've mentioned before that the density of connections in the modifiable synaptic matrix uh, is critical that if you don't have uh, close to full connection density, uh, you, you have uh, trouble forming associations. Uh, and that's illustrated here. These are the three constraints on storage capacity and connectivity is a big one. And so the problem is that if we think of the brain as being uh, randomly connected, uh, it just won't work. We talked about this already, that the average connection probability is about one in a million. And for a symmetric matrix, uh, it's one in a million squared. Uh, so effectively, if you were gonna model the brain, uh, you would leave out synapses altogether because there just aren't that many of them. Uh, and, uh, but we do remember. And so uh, I introduced this idea that uh, if you take the connection matrix and you modularize it uh, into a lot of uh, independent, fully connected modules, then each of these modules uh, can form an associative memory, but then there are no connections left over to connect what's in this module with what's in this module. And that's what I've tried to illustrate here that, you know, if you make the modules about 5,000 instead of 10,000, then there's some connections left over uh, for one module to talk to another. Uh, and this is kind of the origin of the hierarchical memory idea with the hippocampus sitting at the top. But each of these modules being its own associative memory, uh, which is capable of storing 
uh, information that comes into it bottom up. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of versions of this cartoon. Uh, but this idea uh, goes back to David Marr actually originally, uh, or at least parts of this idea. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, his ideas were reactivated uh, in a paper by Tyler and DeSena in 1986, uh, and an update on that theory in uh, 2007, and it basically says that, you know, if this is the cortex and this is the hippocampus, uh, every pattern of activity in the cortex creates a uh, pattern in the hippocampus, uh, which uh, is bidirectional, uh, so that the hippocampus projects back to the cortex. They, the Tyler and DeSena model was not quite what our modern understanding is because they weren't really addressing uh, the, um, the associative nature of the back connections. But anyway, so the idea goes that, you know, if you can retrieve parts of the memory enough to cause pattern completion uh, in the hippocampus, then the back projections cause pattern completion in the original modules uh, and you retrieve the memory. So that's uh, you know pretty much what most people today believe is fundamentally what's going on. Um, consolidation of memory though implies something a little more. Uh, you you have this uh, back projection projecting pattern uh, which uh, causes pattern completion in uh, the cortex, but as time goes by. Uh, these modules start to develop appropriate connections amongst themselves so that for a remote memory, uh, the connections am among the modules in the cortex are sufficient to sustain the memory in the absence of a functional hippocampus. And that's, you know, the basic idea of memory consolidation. But it gets more complicated than that because partly because there are so few of these connections between modules that the brain has to actually, you know, condense all those memories into something uh, that is more compact in a sense, and, uh, but it still needs to uh, be adaptive, allow the organism to uh, make adaptive responses. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of detail in how these connections form and how they enable the brain to function normally uh, using those um, connections that were derived originally from episodic memory. I have a question about this. Yep. When we say that we're forming new connections when we consolidate memory, are we talking in the sense of the synaptic weights are being modified or are we talking in the sense actual new synapses are being formed I'm as just adults? I'm ab just about to answer that question. Okay. Okay. So this uh, idea really requires a number of different kinds of, uh, of plasticity. You have to have what we call a fast learning system, which is erroneously attributed to the hippocampus. Uh, and that's sort of a misunderstanding uh, of uh, a, an earlier paper, which said the hippocampus is a fast, contributes to fast learning, but the cortex actually is capable of this slow learning, which is really the development of uh, representations of knowledge on the basis of the uh, episodic memories. But you have to have, first of all, uh, you have to have four categories of rapid plasticity. You have to have uh, rapid plasticity in the connections from the external world into the cortex and from the cortical modules up into the hippocampus. Those have to be modifiable. You have to have modifiable connections in the descending connections from the higher level modules to the lower modules. You have to have intrahippocampal plasticity so that it does auto association in these some of these modules uh, and also within module plasticity. So 
there's nothing in according to this view there's nothing intrinsically different between what's going on in ca3 of the hippocampus and what's going on in a cortical module they're all attractor memories uh, and uh, they're modularized to some degree but they have a certain amount of existing connections but this there aren't enough of these existing connections to capture all possible associations. Uh, and so the optimal thing for the cortex to be doing is actually rewiring itself on the basis of uh, experience using some kind of learning rule, which produces results that are similar to what we understand in the back propagation uh, algorithm. But as we say, the brain probably doesn't use back propagation and what the algorithm is in the brain remains a mystery. So that is one of the hottest topics in uh, systems neuroscience and also um, deep learning uh, because people, uh, want to see whether, you know, because the brain does things so efficiently, whether they can figure out how the brain is accomplishing it uh, and incorporate those ideas into computer uh, networks. So this slow plasticity, it can be LTP and LTD of existing connections, or it could be growth and rearrangement. So here's a, uh, you know, more modern cartoon of what's going on there. And uh, I talked a little bit earlier about the need uh, to take the hippocampal code and actually distribute it to uh, the modules in the cortex. I'm gonna uh, refresh that idea today, um, but that's kind of uh, the, the basic uh, notion. And uh, so, the question is what makes a good index? Okay, what makes a good pattern that can be distributed to the cortex and useful for retrieving uh, stored data in the, uh, what we call lower level because it's lower than the hippocampus, but higher level uh, relative to the other modules. Uh, okay, so an important point is that the index code doesn't have to contain decodable information about the attributes of the experience. All it is is a bit pattern that has to be relatively unique that is stored in the module at the time of the experience. Okay, so this is critical that at the time this module is getting input from the bottom up it's also getting input top down. And all of that input goes into the synaptic matrix so that what happened in here can be retrieved either bottom up or top down. Okay, a critical point that you have to store the index in the cortex at the time of learning so that it can be used to retrieve uh, data. Okay, and so a random pattern might be as good as anything. And in fact, random patterns are good because they're orthogonal. They're as little correlated as possible, which maximizes the storage capacity. The index code needs to be retrievable by auto association, pattern completion, uh, and so the indexing module has to use sparse coding, which we've seen is the case in the hippocampus. The index has to be broadcast widely to the neocortex, which creates a biological constraint, which we talked about when we talked about the subiculum uh, propagation to the cortex. I'm gonna talk about it briefly again here. Uh, and um, if the, index code is kind of, if, if this problem is solved by uh, compressing the index code before it's sent to the cortex, then there have to be index encoding cells in the cortex. So just to back up here, 
there actually have to be cells here which contain quasi-random patterns that were induced by the output of the hippocampus. And it needs to be spontaneously reactivated while the brain is offline, which should cause reactivation in the cortex. Actually, uh, it can also be reactivated when the brain is online, but uh, as you'll see, uh, this happens a lot during sleep. Questions so far? All right, so we've talked at length about uh, the fact that the dentate gyrus and the granule cells of the uh, cerebellum uh, have this expansion in total numbers. Uh, and that produces output patterns that are less correlated with one another than the input. So we think that both these learning systems uh, have a layer interposed uh, between the input and the memory cells, which uh, spread patterns apart. Uh, we talked about global remapping. Well, in a sense, the path integration system, there's a typo here, uh, the path integration system generates distinct codes for every location. And to the extent that different things are happening at different locations, that gives you an index code for free. And uh, that's why I think that in evolution, the uh, the fact that the hippocampus may have evolved to do path integration became the foundation for what we now think of as the uh, cortical hippocampal memory system. Is it a random pattern? Well, there was a very nice study that came out in 2014 in which they put rats on a 50 meter long track and they recorded from a bunch of hippocampal cells as the rat ran down the track and they noted where all the place fields for every cell occurred. And then they did some fancy math uh, and they showed that uh, the recruitment of a cell to have a place field is what we call a Poisson process. It's memoryless. The fact that it had a field here doesn't give you any basis of predicting whether it's going to have a field right next door or whether it's going to be a long wait and so on. There are statistics that describe such a process, but uh, as best as anybody can tell, uh, these place fields are allocated completely at random. And that's what this memoryless recruitment means, that it doesn't the fact that uh, it had a field here, the cell doesn't remember that. There's probably a very small refractory limit, uh, but remember that place fields don't exist. They're just patterns of activity. It's a burst of spikes. Okay, so the fact that it gave a burst of spikes at one moment, uh, there may be a mild refractory period, but it doesn't uh, change whether there's a going to be a burst of spikes at the next moment or a little later. Now, random is a difficult concept. It usually means, well, we don't know what the cause is. Uh, but anyway, as best we can tell, uh, it's random uh, and th that uh, that gives rise to uncorrelated patterns. Um, and we talked about the problem with using a spatial code when you have to remember different things that happened in the same place. Uh, what happens is that the cells that were allocated to that place by the path integrator change their firing rates unpredictably up or down. And that means that for a given place, the population vectors can point in different directions, meaning that there are different patterns that can be stored. They're going to be correlated for that place. So if I tell you about the kitchen, you'll remember maybe what you had for breakfast this morning, but you might also remember what you had for dinner last night uh, and so forth. Uh, they're quite correlated, but nevertheless, they're distinct. Okay. 
Uh, the rate remapping information, the information about what is coming into the hippocampus comes in through the lateral entorhinal cortex. Remember, there's the medial entorhinal cortex, which is this strip here. And the lateral entorhinal cortex is that strip. Uh, and if you lesion the lateral entorhinal cortex, you lose the, uh, the decorrelation of population vectors in, uh, in, in when you modify the environment. So here is the case of uh, modifying a square to a circle in the same place. This is the distribution of population vector correlations with the entorhinal cortex, the lateral cortex lesioned versus when it's not lesioned. And the correlations are much smaller with an intact lateral entorhinal cortex in the two places. So that uh, shows us that uh, the lateral cor uh, entorhinal cortex is a key uh, source of the information which distinguishes different events that happen at the same place by causing rate remapping. Well, a few other interesting things are uh, with the advent of uh, little microscopes that people can mount on the mouse's head while he runs around and track the same cells over days, which is difficult with microelectrodes. Uh, people started reporting that actually uh, the composition of which cells fire at a given place changes somewhat from day to day. So if you look at the proportion of cells uh, that were active uh, on day one and still active uh, on subsequent days, you see that uh, they, or that were active for all 10 sessions, okay? But what's happening is that some of these cells are coming in and out from day to day, but is creating a different pattern or a different index code and that's great if you want to generate distinct index codes for similar events on different days at the same place. So what did I have for breakfast today? Do I remember what I had for breakfast tomorrow? Well, I've sort of lost yesterday. Sorry, remember what I had for breakfast yesterday? I sort of forget what I had for breakfast yesterday, but uh, I could probably dredge it up if I had to. Okay. The synapses in the cortex and the hippocampus uh, on um, principal cells turn over with a certain lifetime. They have a turnover time of about five to 15 days. In other words, uh, for many of the synapses that were there on day one, they won't be there on day 22 and, and different synapses will have taken their place. And what's interesting is that in the hippocampus, uh, the most of the synapses have this uh, 10 to 15 uh, day um, turnover rate. The blocking NMDA receptor doesn't affect the turnover dynamics. Oh, wait a minute. Actually, I better check that, but I think it doesn't affect the turnover dynamics. Uh, and experience itself doesn't change the dynamics. In other words, the fact that I experienced something today doesn't accelerate the turnover of synapses. In the cortex, it's quite different. There are um, a large population of synapses don't turn over at all. Uh, and uh, there is another population which has a fairly short lifespan. Uh, this paper is a bit old, not very old, and there may be more information on that. But basically, this suggests that one of the mechanisms that the hippocampus uses to rearrange its index code is that the actual connections are changing spontaneously during uh, over time. And that's also good if you want to generate new index codes for events at different times. <laughs>
Okay, uh, we talked about the projection from the subiculum back to the cortex and the idea that the subiculum compresses the hippocampal, the CA3 output. I left out CA1 here for simplicity. Uh, so we have a go from a very sparse code to a very distributed or non-sparse code, which is uh, very useful for transmitting information as long as you don't want to store it. But if you do want to store it, then you're going to have to unpack uh, this, and that unpacking could occur in the superficial layer of the cortex. Uh, and uh, hypothetically, this is still under exploration. It could be that the actual uh, data or the attributes are stored in the deeper layers. And now I'm having a senior moment. I think I talked to you already about place cells in the cortex, right? You all remember that? Well, just in case you didn't, uh, if you record from superficial layer uh, cortex cells uh, using various techniques, uh, this case was imaging, you find that uh, the environment uh, is covered uh, with place fields of cortical cells. So this is cell one to 176, uh, organized according to where they fired on the track. Some cells have more than one place field, as you can see, but this is the peak. Uh, so the superficial cortex behaves a lot like CA1 of the hippocampus. And uh, it's not just in the retrosplenial cortex, but it turns out that almost anywhere you look in the cortex, you're going to see in the superficial layers this kind of spatial, spatially coupled or spatially correlated. We now call them position correlated cells because we don't know what space really is. But uh, this is the as the animal runs on a belt with tactile cues or in a visual virtual environment, uh, you get uh, cells which fire uh, at distinct positions. And if you lesion the hippocampus, those spatial codes don't develop or are impaired. Okay, and now hot off the press, this paper is just about to come out. Uh, it was shown that uh, if you train the animal on the belt before you lesion the hippocampus, the representation of that belt is retained, but the animal is unable to develop a representation of a novel belt. And in addition, the animal remembers where on the uh, familiar belt it should lick to get water, but is unable to uh, learn to lick at a new location. So this is probably the first study that has shown uh, evidence for s consolidation at the level of neural representations in the cortex. We now have a cortical spatial code or index code, if you like, uh, that is becomes independent of the hippocampus over time. So this is the sort of general model that this is seeming to lead to. Uh, this is still only a hypothesis, but this is kind of the, the theory behind some of these experiments. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears and talk about semantic memory and the role of the hippocampus. So again, uh, the I told you the, the standard model is, uh, been updated and most people now accept that uh, what happens is hippocampal dysfunction leaves semantic knowledge relatively intact, but it disrupts recent memory and new learning. So if there hasn't been time for the cortical, cortical connections yet to form, and that does take uh, some time, uh, it's, that memory is not, not retained. So the modern idea is that memory consolidation is somehow a process of extraction of semantic knowledge from the bulk of episodic memory. Okay, well, uh, that idea is turns out to be quite old. 
A lot of people didn't read David Marr in the early 70s, uh, but uh, he basically said is that the, the cortex is the organ that decomposes uh, information and forms concepts and classifies data. Okay. Uh, it, unlike the hippocampus, which he thought was just simply a attractor memory, which uh, you know stored patterns. Okay, so knowledge is can be likened to a statistical model of the world. Okay, you come into a certain situation and you think that uh, certain things could happen with certain probabilities. You sit on a chair, you think it's unlikely that the leg is going to collapse, but it could. It's a statistical model of the world. And uh, that requires creating high level features. Okay, we've talked about this at several times that there are things in the world like my new iPhone uh, that uh, evolution couldn't have predicted. And yet any of us can recognize uh, a telephone, uh, you know, and, and even get confused. If I put a block of wood to my ear, you'll think that, you know, I have some strange looking telephone. Uh, so we've got high level feature detectors for things that uh, are in our own experience, but are, we're not there in the experience of our ancestors. And those are located, those feature detectors high up in the cortex. Down here in the lower level cortex, the feature detectors uh, behave, uh, I'm pretty certain, uh, just as they did in our ancestors. Although there is evidence that they're modifiable to some degree. Okay, so, uh, I like to say that deep learning wasn't really invented by the AI community, it was invented by evolution. But how it does it is still uh, up for grabs. So having knowledge gives us the ability to predict the future. It allows us to make assessments and give probabilities about you know, what's gonna happen in the future but it doesn't always work. Uh, and so in this paper, which uh, was written back in uh, the dark ages, 1995, uh, we tried to lay out some of the um, factors which uh, control the or, or underlie the interaction between the hippocampus and the cortex uh, and think a little bit about what the cortex is actually doing. A lot of the ideas in this paper are just extensions of what David Marr wrote in the 70s. Uh, but we considered a, uh, an early version of a deep learning network. This is a network which uh, learns to retrieve uh, the properties of living things. Uh, so this is a multi-layered, you know, several hidden layers. It's got a, a, a relationship layer. And basically if you say Robin and an Isa and go through the hidden layers, it's gonna come out with some attributes. It's a bird, uh, it's a Robin, yeah. Uh, it's pretty, it's red. Uh, it can grow, move, and fly, but it doesn't swim, and so forth. And if I said sunfish, I'll get a different, uh, the network will learn to retrieve a different set of attributes. And we considered what goes on during learning in this hidden layer, which is taken as being somewhere in the cortex. So, and this is a backpropagation network, starting off with uh, with random weights, we see that you can't tell the difference between these different inputs in the hidden layer. They're responding, you know, for example, robin and pine look pretty similar uh, and so forth. After about 200 training trials, you can see that the network has split off 
the animals from the plants. And after uh, about 500 learning trials, you can see that the network has made a finer split between birds and fish. And if you keep on going, uh, then it splits off the different kinds of fish and birds, okay? So that's basically what happens in training one of these networks, that the hidden layer develops feature representations or population codes for the different classes of items that it experienced. And if we uh, do a, a clustering on these, uh, on the hidden layers, looking at the patterns that they're emitting, we can see that as time goes by, the patterns are getting more and more distinct from one another. That's what this increased connection distance in the clustering algorithm shows. What you'll also notice is that the patterns are getting sparser. Okay, here's quite a distributed pattern and as time goes by, the patterns get sparser. Okay, well, we have some other breaking news, hot off the press. My graduate student Rajat uh, just uh, finished his first major experiment uh, testing this hypothesis. And what he finds that in animals that have had uh, a lot of experience on a complex environment, running around with different toys, getting changed on a daily basis uh, versus animals that just run little hurdles, uh, that there is uh, an increase in the, the representation becomes sparser in the cortex, not in the hippocampus. This may change as we get more data, but I don't actually expect it to get sparser in the hippocampus because the hippocampus is just storing index codes. But uh, the sparsity uh, changes as a result of this experience and also the patterns uh, well, as a consequence of getting more sparse, the patterns get further apart from one another. Uh, in addition, if you look at all the spontaneous activity in the cortex, uh, and I'm not going to explain exactly what this means uh, unless you understand principal component analysis, but uh, the principal component analysis distribution is flatter meaning that the, there are more patterns there that can't be lumped into a common pattern. The patterns are less correlated with one another. So those are changes in the cortical connectivity. And then he also looked at the connectivity and he found that uh, there were changes in the uh, divergence and convergence of uh, excitatory cells uh, so in the enriched animals, uh, there were less excitatory to excitatory connections, meaning they weren't spread out all over the place. Uh, and um, the, uh, that's the fan out and that's the fan in. And in the in inhibition to excitation, or the inhibitory cells, there were more inhibitory to excitatory connections, meaning that there's probably more inhibition going on. And likewise, more inhibitory cells converge on a single pyramidal cell. So it's starting to shape up that it looks a little bit like uh, the prediction of this model. Uh, and we're starting to get some insight into what happens in a cortex that's acquired over a good period of its lifetime complex information. Okay, but there's a problem with acquiring new data, uh, which is now very familiar in the machine learning field. And the problem is characterized by this uh, uh, slide here, that if you train the network up on, you know, this, the set of, of inputs that we just described, uh, so that it's performing very well, 
and, and then say, oh, and by the way, I want you to learn about a penguin. I'm going to add something. Penguin's a bird that can move, swim, and grow, has wings, but it can't fly. If you say, okay, I'm just going to give you many, many trials on this one item. So I'm going to cram it into your head. Then it acquire, the network acquires it very quickly, but it accumulates a huge amount of error in everything else. Well, not quite everything else, and I'm, that turns out to be a key point. However, if you do what we call interleaved learning, and that is you give trials on a penguin, but then you also refresh the trials on all the other things the network learned, then of course it learns the penguin more slowly, but it has much less interference. So this problem came to be known, uh, there was a famous paper by McCloskey and Cohen uh, who first showed it, that it came to be co called catastrophic forgetting or catastrophic interference and is a major problem uh, in deep learning networks and a lot of smart people are working on it. Uh, okay, well, so, uh, just as an illustration, suppose we first train a network to learn about politicians, and then we say, okay, you've learned the politicians and now learn about dogs. Well, then you get some kind of interference. On the other hand, if you do interleaved learning, then you can separate the politicians from the dogs sometimes. How do we arrange to interleave multiple trials of events that occur only once? Okay. It takes many training trials making small adjustments to the weights. And so uh, that led, uh, well, David Marr again, uh, to the idea that uh, at least part of the transfer, he called it a transfer, it's not really a transfer, between the hippocampus and the cortex must take place during sleep when the cortex isn't busy processing new information. What it's doing is refreshing all the old stuff. And that could happen by spontaneous retrieval of the hippocampal index code leading to sp spontaneous retrieval of the stored episodic memory in the cortex, which would somehow enable the gradual adjustment of the cortical, cortical connections. So that idea definitely goes to David Marr. Uh, and that leads us to the trace reactivation theory, which is basically that while the brain's not busy processing external inputs, it's refreshing its own knowledge as part of the interleaved learning process. Uh, the prediction is that when the hippocampus retrieves its pattern, it causes to synchronous reactivation of the information in different modules, which allows associations to form among them. Uh, and that leads to the reorganization of the horizontal connections. So this is the basic complementary learning theory idea that the hippocampus is firing off patterns that reflect recent memories, and that causes a retrieval of the new information in the cortex. But because the old information has a lot of uh, interconnections now, it's capable of spontaneous retrieval on its own. And so you get uh, sort of mixtures of new and old information being played back in the cortex. And that is what is thought to save the mammalian cortex from catastrophic uh, forgetting or interference. So what's the evidence for this reactivation? I'm going to now spend the rest of today talking about the evidence uh, for that. The first evidence uh, actually came from uh, some uh, people by the name of Jonathan Winston, and I forget his first name, Abzug, uh, who showed that if a cell had been active uh, during behavior in the hippocampus and the animal went to sleep, it was more likely to be 
active during sleep than during the sleep before the time it had been confined to the place field. If they took the animal, they were listening to one cell at a time. They stuck the animal in the place field many times so that they got a lot of activity of the cell. And then they let the animal go to sleep. Uh, and sure enough, they found that there was more activity of that cell as a consequence of having been active a lot in the previous behavior. That doesn't quite show memory retrieval because that could simply be some kind of cellular uh, adaptation. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, all the cells that were involved at that place are firing together. It could be explained just by there being a buildup of uh, something in the cell. Uh, maybe uh, the cell has a prolonged depolarization. Maybe there's a change in its uh, potassium conductances, all kinds of possible reasons. Uh, and so the real first evidence uh, came from looking at ensembles of hippocampal cells. Uh, and so basically, again, I don't need to explain this to you again. These are e the firing rate maps for different cells simultaneously recorded. And the question is, how can we tell if a memory was being reactivated? Well, if a memory was being reactivated during the experience itself, these cells, for example, fired more or less at the same place and at the same time, right? So those cells that were correlated during the behavior would be expected to have correlated activity during sleep. Uh, and so that's what this first demonstration that Matt Wilson did, uh, where he showed that uh, if you link, the, all those dots represent simultaneously recorded cells. The red lines, the thick lines uh, are cells that uh, had strong correlations during the behavior and also strong correlations either before the behavior or during the sleep after the behavior. And it's pretty clear from looking at this that a lot of the strong correlations that were induced during the behavior persist in the spontaneous activity afterwards. And so that is evidence that patterns are patterns of activity, not just cells acting independently, are being retrieved in the cortex. What type of sleep is that? REM sleep yeah. or deep sleep? Uh, OK, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, maybe we were fortunate in that most of the time uh, that rats sleep or people, it's in slow wave sleep. And it seems that most of the memory trace reactivation that is has been experimentally observed, not all of it, but most of it occurs during the first hour after the animal goes into slow wave sleep. And it's been difficult uh, to really get a firm handle on whether there's real reactivation during REM sleep. There is certainly some uh, evidence for it, uh, but uh, it's still a, a slightly controversial to topic. But in addition to cells that were correlated firing together, you would expect that cells that were not correlated should not fire together, right? And so a, a, a slightly different mathematical approach was taken to kind of include all the information, not only about cells which fired together, but also cells which didn't fire together. And that would be to uh, take the, the correlation uh, between every pair of cells. So if you have N cells, you have N onto N minus one over two correlations. And that's one of the benefits of recording lots of cells because that goes up as the square of the number of cells. Uh, so the correlations become data points. And if you plot, the so each dot here is the correlation between a pair of cells, and this is the correlation between running on the track and the slow wave sleep before the running on the track. And this is the correlation afterwards. You can see it's pretty noisy, but it almost always goes up. <laughs> 
And so you can calculate uh, the regression line. You can do a partial regression analysis. I'm not going to go into the details with you, but you can come up with a term, which is the square of the regression coefficient, which is what we call explained variance. And we're uh, asking how much does the variance of the correlation distribution during post-behavior sleep, how much is it explained by the correlations that were present during the behavior? Uh, compare that uh, or partialing out with, using partial uh, correlation methods, whatever correlations existed before the behavior. So whatever's left over is the amount of variation that's explained by the learning. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is the explained correlation variance. It goes up, uh, in, but it decays over time. Uh, after about an hour in rats, it's hard to uh, detect it. There are other ways that can detect it comes back, it flickers in and out, but it's most intense right after the behavior which suggests that maybe there's some short-term associative plasticity mechanism that we don't know about or that you know the natural decay of LTP might not be the same as experimental LTP, but regardless, uh, it fades out somewhat over time. Uh, this effect is NMDA receptor dependent. So there's some kind of NMDA receptor dependent plasticity going on uh, that induces this phenomenon. When does reactivation occur in the hippocampus? Well, you know by now that the hippocampus has fundamentally two different states. When the animal is moving around, you have this uh, seven cycle per second, seven hertz uh, rhythm called the theta rhythm. And when the animal settles down, to rest or even stops momentarily, uh, the hippocampus emits these bursts of uh, high frequency activity. Uh, there's very little low frequency. You can see in the raw trace here, this uh, high frequency uh, little envelope. And if you plot the number of, or the population uh, probability of a cell firing, uh, before and after sharp waves, you can see that there's a huge increase in the firing during these sharp wave ripples. And then, so if you separate the data into the, all the spikes that occurred between the ripples, there aren't as many spikes per second, but the inter-ripple intervals are longer, so there's still quite a few spikes. Most of the explained variance occurs uh, during the sharp wave ripples. So that leads us to the conclusion that the hippocampal sharp wave ripple is a reflection of the convergence of the associative network onto a stored pattern uh, and emitting an output burst which reflects stored information. What about sequences? Well, this is Heb's phase sequence idea, and we talk a lot about sequence encoding in the Hebmar network, uh, and the fact that uh, if you put in a sequence of patterns uh, and you change the pattern every cycle, then uh, the network encodes what's happening now associated with what's just happened a moment before, and that allows the network to retrieve the sequence. The prediction behaviorally is if the rat runs through the same sequence over and over again, then the cells which fired here uh, and were driven by whatever the A input is, uh, sorry, let's talk about the B cell here, that the B cell will begin to fire when the animal is at A because of the intrinsic connections from A onto B, right? The matrix is asymmetrical so that the A cells connect with B, the B cells connect with C. And so if the animal is at A, you would expect to start to see some firing of these cells. So it would look like the place field shifts 
its center of mass backwards from the direction of running. Okay, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, this is sort of the average result that this is the initial distribution of the center of mass. This is averaged over all these cells. Uh, and that with uh, experience, there's a retrograde expansion. It's not huge, but it's significant. And so if you look in sleep, uh, what you see is that if you look at two cells that are not really correlated during the first resting session, and what, what we're looking now at is the autocorrelation, or sorry, the cross-correlation function, which is basically if cell A fired, what's the probability that cell B fired before or after it? And during behavior, you see uh, this sort of broad correlation that's asymmetric. And that asymmetry is due to the fact that cell two tends to fire after cell one. Okay, and then as the animal goes to sleep, you see something very similar. Uh, it's not this broad function, but it's this sort of time compressed function, uh, but still cell two is firing af uh, after cell one. So that's evidence uh, for the retrieval of sequential patterns in the hippocampus during slow wave sleep. There are much more sophisticated tools for looking at this today. Uh, this paper goes back uh, a long way and people have come a long way since this. Um, we also see coherent reactivation between the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens, which is the nucleus uh, in the striatum or, or the archie striatum uh, that uh, is involved in uh, sort of coding active, uh, affective value uh, and so forth. Uh, and basically, if you record from a bunch of cells down here, there are inputs from CA3 going directly down here. Uh, and uh, if you look at the um, mean firing rate during hippocampal sharp wave ripples, it goes up. And then if you look, if you parse the cells that you record into cells that are modulated by the hippocampal sharp wave ripples and those that aren't, and then calculate the reactivation measure explained variance, you see that there is reactivation in the accumbens uh, among the population of cells that are affected by hippocampal output. So it looks like hippocampus is driving reactivation uh, in the nucleus accumbens, which is good because if you want to remember where the food is, uh, it would be useful to remember how good the food tasted. Okay, now the cortex. The cortex also shows reactivation. Uh, if you, but cortex has a very interesting dynamic that is in some sense quite different from the hippocampus. During slow wave sleep, the cortex exhibits what we call up and down states. It's a very important concept. There are periods in which the cortex, so this is about 200 or about 150 cells and each dot's a spike from a different, you know, from that cell along the rows. And uh, the cortex has these periods when it seems to go dead off. Okay, that's called the down state. They last um, 100, 200 milliseconds. And then it pops back up and cells start firing again. And then it shuts off and cells start firing again. And if you look at the cortical EEG, you get these uh, these deflections, which correspond to the down state. They're not as clear as if you're looking at a population of cells, but you get these deflections. And when the cortex pops up, very often you get a spindle, uh, which is an oscillation of about 12 Hertz, which is a 
um, an oscillation that involves the th 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 thalamocortical uh, connections. The oscillation is, is probably being driven in the thalamus. Anyway, uh, if you look at the total spike count, which is just to add the columns here, you see that just before the spindle or just before the upstate, the spike count drops almost to zero and then it pops back up. And so if you now do the explained variance experiment and ask uh, the magnitude of the explained variance versus uh, the sort of number of up and down state transitions, you see that there's a very strong uh, relationship, meaning that when the cortex is engaged in this fluctuation from downstate to upstate, downstate, upstate, and so forth, that's actually when memory is being retrieved in the cortex. What about sequences in the cortex? Uh, remember uh, that in order to store sequences, you have to have the patterns changing quite quickly. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to get to that. Let me just see where I am here. Uh, yes, I'm going to get to that. OK. Uh, so the hippocampus exhibits a very interesting phenomenon related to this theta rhythm. And it's called phase precession. phase procession. Uh, what does that mean? It means that when the cell fires, it fires in relation to where in the theta or to, to the phase of the theta rhythm. So each black line is one theta cycle. And you can see this cell starts firing, the blue cell starts firing late in the theta cycle. And then uh, with successive cycles, it moves earlier and earlier and earlier until the by the time the animal leaves the place field, it's firing at the beginning of the theta cycle. Procession occurs anytime you have two oscillators that oscillate at a slightly different frequency, right? So you can see the blue cell is firing, bursting periodically but the frequency of the bursting, the interburst frequency is just a little bit faster than the theta rhythm. And so it finishes a cycle a little bit earlier each time. And so as the animal runs through, it's shifted 180 degrees. Now let's take a cell one, which is the first cell the animal encounters and it goes through the, this phase procession and then runs a little bit further and cell two starts to fire and then cell three starts to fire and then cell four starts to fire. And they're all going through this precession. Well, if you look within a single theta cycle, what you see is that the temporal order of the firing is compressed into a narrow window, the cells are continuing to fire in the same temporal order. And the pattern, you're, we're only seeing one of the cells that is active here, but the overall pattern, what that means is changing very quickly. You've got a pattern which on the macro scale looks like it's changing quite slowly. That's the scale of the so-called place field. But on the theta scale, it's changing very quickly. And it's the theta scale, which is the scale that matters here, because that's the time, sort of the open time of the NMDA receptor channel. And so what this appears to be is a device that the hippocampus has created to explicitly make it good at storing sequences. People have 
argued about, you know, why is there a theta rhythm in the hippocampus and what's it doing and so forth. Uh, and then uh, O'Keefe and Retche discovered uh, the phase procession phenomenon and people gave it a lot of thought. And one of the effects there is to preserve the temporal order of firing exactly within each theta cycle. And that would enable the sequential coupling of the cells. So imagine you have spike timing dependent plasticity. Well, the presynaptic cell be, um, fires before the postsynaptic cell. So the, the, this synapse uh, has a positive weight change. This one has a negative weight change. And that allows the green to red sequence to be encoded. And that's what probably accounts for this uh, phenomenon. Um, but now the plot thickens. Because you during behavior, not only do you get reactivation, spontaneous reactivation when the animal stops in the forward direction. But sometimes you see reactivation of the sequences in the backward direction. Well, a lot of people got very excited by that because that's sort of a prediction of reinforcement learning. Uh, we're not gonna go into depth about that, but uh, the fact that it occurs has become, you know, a major area of study, uh, and I don't think it's yet fully understood. At least I haven't seen any papers that really explain uh, adequately how that can happen. I can give you some some ideas, but uh, you know, uh, imagine that there's. That, that there is some coupling in the reverse direction, but it's weaker than the forward direction. Uh, and if the animal has just run in the forward direction, maybe those synapses are a little tired. And so it's uh, sort of the reverse direction uh, connections uh, dominate, but we don't need to, to dwell on that. Uh, but that, uh, what we're seeing here is essentially a time compressed reactivation of uh, this sort of more spatially or temporally distributed pattern. Uh, so we can think about it like this, if this is sort of the uh, encoding during behavior uh, that we take this whole sequence and we just squash it down in time uh, and we reactivate a little snippet of it. And I guess actually, uh, rather than, let's see how much I have to go here. Yeah, uh, we'll, we're gonna leave it there uh, next uh, Tuesday uh, after Thanksgiving, we'll finish this off and maybe start into the module on oscillations. Questions? Going once. See so you have a good turkey or whatever. Bye. <laughs>